J Mac told me to be fiery, so that's, you know, thought I'd get off to a quick start here. But we're going to be in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, and then we're going to finish up in uh, Esther chapter 3, a couple of Old Testament books. I just want to let you know, every time I come here, I am so encouraged by this church. To, I was just telling Mike earlier that I remember coming in, Bob, you know, your pastor, uh, brought my, me in and, and, and said, what do you think? I'm like, oh my goodness. I thought our church was a wreck, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know and then to watch what the Lord has done through you is an, an encouragement. And can I tell you, in America today, we need more churches like yours. We need more encouragement. We, we can get caught up in all the bad news that's out there. And, but we have a great God. Amen? If I got to ask you for amens, we're going to be here all night long, okay? But we do have it. Thank you. We have a great God. And you need to realize just how blessed you are to have in this age of Laodicea in which we live in, in an age in which so many churches have succumbed to mm, entertainment they, they've lost their mission. They've lost their passion for the Lord. They've lost the word of God. And you are blessed to have a pastor who stands on the truth. I got two, three. Bob, uh, later we'll talk to you about getting more amens. But <clears throat> he is, you know, when, when I was growing up, spiritually speaking, at First Bible, and, and many of you, I, how many are from, from First Bible, you would say, okay, look, there you go. And, we, and I grew up under the preaching of Pastor George Grace. He was known as Pastor Grace. Well, in the Institute, Bob was known as Pastor Truth. Because he stood on the truth, right? And, and as he's grown through the years, uh, I've just watched the Lord use him in great and mighty ways. And, and, and you know, and I watched these guys. Mike, he was just a, I saw him, you know, we, we worked together in the baseball ministry. His dad was instrumental in the baseball and basketball ministry back there. And we just, we just watched these young men grow into old guys. <laughs> With children and, and families and their families love the Lord. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And I just want to encourage you tonight to, to stay the course. Make sure you finish your race well. And I can't think of no better way to do that than for these individuals. You are the heart of the church. Those that will come out on a Thursday night and hear some preacher from Naples, you know, you, you have the stuff. And you need to pass it along. You need to maintain it and then pass it along to others. And, and you need to understand that you're not done. God's not done with you. You have not arrived. As good as you're doing, you're not arrived. Amen? You're just not there yet. Hey, there you go. I got another one. You haven't arrived. Uh, Romans 8.29 tells us, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. It is the destiny of every truly born-again Christian to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And the more folks within any church that will commit themselves to the will of God in that manner, to become more Christ-like on a daily basis, those are the churches you want to be a part of. And that's the kind of church you always want to have. But it can slip away so quickly. And I just want to give us some words of encouragement tonight to help us to stay that course. <sighs> Truth be told, you know, I, I, I'm so far away from being like Jesus. You know, you think after 25 years, I'd be a better person. And I think I am, but I'm not where I need to be. And I'm always asking my congregation, I'm always asking myself this question, and I want to present it to you tonight. When was the last time that you and God had a sit down and he convicted you of something that you know you need to change and you just haven't done it? You just haven't gotten around to it. And if I ask you that question and you go back and you're probably right now thinking, oh yeah, well my spouse, she needs to change or he needs to change here 
And, and by children, they certainly need to change here. And maybe a co-worker, they certainly need to repent and change there. But what is God working on you with? It's a sobering question. And it's one that we need to ask ourselves more often than we do. I remember I asked it last night with my men at the, at the church. You know, I told them, I said, you know, I've been saved 25 years. And there are still things that I'm struggling with. Right? Now, when I got saved, it was easy. The big things, psh, 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 right? How many remember when you got saved? How many are too old to remember when you got saved? Okay. But, you know, remember how easy it was? Oh, this is dumb. Why am I doing this? Look, out the door went. Oh, I got to go to church in the week. In the week? Not just on Sundays? Yes, during the week, yes. I want to hear more about God's word. Oh, I can go to a home Bible study? I need to do that. Remember, all that stuff became easy. And you started getting into a routine. And all of a sudden, you're like, maybe you're not as fervent as you once were. Because we have a real enemy, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood alone. We, our flesh and our blood, yes, but we don't wrestle against that. It's spiritual wickedness in high places. And how many have ever had a fiery dart come into your head, and you're like, where did that just come from? Because the spiritual battle is real, and Satan knows what he's doing. You know why it's so much easier for us to think of everybody else's problems? It's because in this flesh dwelleth what? Come on, you know it. No good thing. Mike knows it, okay? The rest of you should know it now. Romans 7, 18. In this flesh dwelleth no good thing. Our flesh is great at seeing the faults of others. We tend to have huge blind spots, though, with our own faults. It's no wonder that Christ had to admonish us in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. He says this, and he says, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thy I, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. And then he goes on to say, thou hypocrite. You know, Jesus didn't candy coat it. Amen? He was not a candy coater. He told it like it is. Sometimes people will tell me, hey, hey, pastor, you could have been a little gentler with that. I'm like, you know what? No. No. When God wanted Moses' attention, did he beat around the bush? No, he set the thing on fire. Amen? And so that's, that's what we need today. We need to, to allow the Lord to set us on fire again. And don't say, oh, well, I'll, I was on fire, but I burned out. No, 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 no. The bush was never consumed. When God's in it, you will not be consumed. And so, so many times I see Christians, they, they're running like on a treadmill. And they're not getting anywhere because they're doing it in their flesh instead of learning how to walk with the Spirit of God that lives within us. He says, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat in thy brother's eye. Our flesh is so corrupted that if we're not careful, we can find ourselves judging God himself. And you say, well, that would never happen. Well, how many times through the years have you heard this question? People asking God, why did God allow that? Why didn't God hear my prayer? Why did my father, my spouse, my child, why, 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 why? We're judging God when we ask those questions. If I was in charge, that would have never happened. I, I, you see how arrogant that sounds? And we have to be careful of that we don't end up judging the Lord. And why do we do that? Why, do we, why would we ever think we know more or better than the Lord? Well, in Isaiah, the prophet wrote this in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than yours, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
God's ways are indeed far beyond our understanding. And we must be careful never to question his ways. I'm always telling my folks down in Naples, listen, this book, you have your Bible with you tonight? Don't go and try and correct it. It wasn't written so that you could correct it. It wasn't written so the intellectuals in some institute or some, some uh, seminary could correct it. You have the Word of God. It's called the King James Bible. And he preserved it in your own language. And you ought to be thanking God you have it. You don't come to this book to correct it. It was written to correct you and me. So with that in mind, let me pray, and then we'll get into 1 Samuel 15 here. Heavenly Father, once again, we do come. We can do nothing in our flesh. We can do nothing by ourselves. The only thing that will ever last is what you do. And I pray that you will work in your people tonight, that you would give this preacher unction from on high, and that you would work in the hearts of your people to have free course And Lord, that you would be glorified through it all. Teach us, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people would say, amen. Well, 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. Samuel, it says, Samuel also said unto Saul. Now Samuel was the prophet, Saul was the king. The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now listen to these next words. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. I just got through saying that sometimes people judge God. Sometimes people want to resist the word of God. Amen? Amen. Thank you. But it's a God-ordained biblical principle that many people in this Laodicean age in which we live are uncomfortable with if they won't outright reject it. And that's this. Do you know that your pastor is to rule over you? I didn't get a single amen on that one. (laughs) See, people in general, and, and, and Americans in particular, they don't like submitting to authority, whether it be God ordained or not. We like to rule our own selves and tend to recoil at the thought of someone else telling me what to do. Right? Think about your last argument with your spouse, with your children. It was over different thoughts. Somebody trying to convince me to do something I don't want to do, or vice versa. But Hebrews 13, 7, it says this. It says, remember them which have the what? Does anybody know the next word? Rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. That's God's word. He follows that up just 10 verses later in Hebrews 13, 17, saying, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, clearly, pastors are not to lord over the flock. But just as clearly, pastors are to rule. And we are to obey them. I I knew this was going to be a popular message. but And you know why we struggle with that? Because the world has indoctrinated us into its way of thinking. No one's going to tell me what to do. I have the Holy Spirit. How many have has the Holy Spirit in here? The rest of you ought to get saved, all right? You have the Holy Spirit. True. How many have made mistakes by not asking the Holy Spirit or following the Holy Spirit? That's why you need a ruler. Pastors spend oodles of time in the Word of God, and they need help. And that's why we have you know, other elders, and and, and that's why a multitude of counselors we are surrounded by. We surround ourselves by those who can help us see our faults because we understand we have them 
It's just I can never remember what they are. But I trust Bob, your pastor, to, to help see, for me to be a mirror for me when the Bible isn't being a mirror or I'm not looking into it the way it should be. In a congregation, the best congregations trust their pastor. And the best pastors rule by way of the word of God. They're, they don't tell you, they don't stand up, they don't go, Denise, uh, you need to start doing da 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 They don't do that. They just preach, and they let the Holy Spirit work in each individual. But they may say things that are offensive to the world. Now, I know your pastor would never say anything offensive to the world. <laughs> right? And, and yet, when he does, he gets attacked. Not, not by you, you're the core. But you need to stand up for him. You, he needs to be able to count on you to say, hey, wait a second. It's true. That's the Bible. You may, not, you may be brainwashed by this world system into thinking that you name it. Can I say some things? Like homosexuality is okay these days. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's an abomination. Okay? But so is lying. So is discording, or yeah, so is, so is sowing discord amongst the brethren. So are feet swift to mischief. These two are an abomination. It's not just one lifestyle, it's, it's all of our sins. All of them. But when, when pastor gets up here and he says, hey, you know, and I t this is what I say to my congregation. Hey, listen, I know some of you guys got tats you know, a long time ago, but don't put new ones on, right? Do you understand your body is what? The temple of the, the Holy Ghost. How many would be all in favor of people spray painting your building around here? No one? But there's this, this sense that, oh, just, it's my body, I get my choice. It's not your body. You've been bought with a price, right? Now, you see, the and people get upset. Well, I like my tats. I like my piercings. I like my thoughts. I like, I, I, I don't want to hate uh, gays. I, nobody's asking you to hate gays. You understand that? No one is asking you to hate gays. I have a cousin that's gay. I love her to death. But I fear for her death because I don't think she's going to heaven because she will not bow the knee. What bothers me most is gay pride. Right? Gay pride. What are you talking about? You're proud about that? Should we have an adulterous pride parade? What do you think? That's, you know, a liar's pride parade. How about a thief's pride parade, right? It's ridiculous, but gay pride, you can't talk about gay pride. Please, don't put this on the internet. They'll find me. But it's true. Is it not truth? Pastors are to fear God, not men. Pastors are called to please God, not men. Pastors are to hearken as it says in the verse, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord, just as Saul told Samuel. Now, Paul admonished the young pastor in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, chapter 4, 2 through 4. He said, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why did he have to say that? He said us in the next verse, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And as I said, you know, Jesus was full of both what? Grace and truth. And when Pastor Bredo was up at First Bible, there was grace, and there was truth. And I, I enjoyed both, right? How many like God's grace? How many love God's truth, right? And that's the way it should be. We, you are to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, who was full of 
grace and truth. You don't sacrifice the truth so you can be full of grace. You, <laughs> you go ahead and continue in your sin. That's fine. I don't want to offend you. I know you're going to go to hell, spend all eternity suffering in torment, but you do that because I want to show you grace. Is that really grace? Is that love? No. We don't have to be mean to tell somebody they're sinning. Amen? If I mess up, you can come and, to me and tell me, hey, you know, pastor, and I'm going to go, ew. Right? Forgive me. That's, that's how you grow in grace and truth. You have to be able to receive criticism. You have to be able to admit, I need to change. If you can't admit you need to change, then you're saying, I'm as good as Christ right now. And that's, that's as arrogant as I can think of. So I would encourage you, when you hear somebody griping or complaining about something that pastor says, and you know it's the truth, back them up. Back them up. Don't, don't let it just slide. Don't say, oh, you know, just mealy mouth, walk away. No. With grace, stand up for the truth. Verse 2 in, second, in first Samuel there, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now here's a perfect example of how people can judge God. We have to be careful with our 21st century sensibilities to judge God unfairly here. And quite frankly, I'm glad I live in the New Testament. I don't have to worry about God giving me such a commandment. Amen? Amen. But did he give that commandment to, to King Saul? Yes, he did. Did he mean it? Yes, he did. Did they do it? If you know your Bible, you know they didn't. Look down at verse 7. King Saul and the people of Israel didn't seem ready to completely obey the Lord. How many of us tonight would say, I'm still not completely obeying the Lord? And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until the, thou comest to shore that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse. That they destroyed utterly. Now, the instructions of the Lord given in verse 3, they're very clear, very specific. Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. And slay both man, woman, infant, suckling, ox, sheep, camel, ass. But the people said, no, nah, you know, it's, that sounds harsh. I, I got a better idea. We're, you know, God certainly didn't mean that. I know what's good. I can discern good from evil. So I'm going to do something that God tells me not to do, or I'm not going to do what God tells me to do. Works both ways. And I'm afraid their behavior is not all that different from what you and I have done. As I asked earlier, remember when you were saved? How you cleaned up your life? You, 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 you did this? Oh, and you, were, and you were on fire for the Lord. You couldn't wait to get to church to find out the next thing you were going to do. And then a pastor like yours pointed out something in the scriptures and you weren't ready. Well, that's over the top. He didn't need to say it like that. It wasn't what he said. It was how he said it. You ever hear those excuses? 
Hopefully they're not coming out of your mouth anymore. These are, you are mature, growing Christians, right? You don't make excuses for yourselves anymore, do you? Uh, of course not. We've just gotten a lot better at it. Paul, or Saul, and, and the people spared Agag and all that they saw, that they thought was good, and they destroyed only that which they saw as vile. And then comes along Samuel and he points. He says, you didn't do what God asked you to do. And then comes along Pastor Bredo and he points at your new tattoo. And he doesn't say, Bob, I don't know why you got that tattoo, I, you know. But you feel like, the lights are all shining. And Bob doesn't have a new tattoo. I'm just using him as an example because we're old friends and he knows I'm only using him as an example. But you just feel like the whole congregation is now looking at you and your flesh doesn't like it. And instead of feeling conviction, you feel anger and you want to shoot the messenger and you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. When you, when you allow your flesh to take over like that, you are basically saying, I'm right, God's wrong. And all of a sudden you find yourself in that battle all over again. Why is it so hard now? I'm more mature in the Lord now. Why is it harder for me to change now? And you know why? Because you left it there too long. You let it linger. Anybody that has a nice lawn? I'm a lawn guy. I like nice lawns. All of a sudden, this weed pops up. If I don't get on that thing, next thing I know, it's all over the place. It spreads. That's what sin is like. You don't get rid of a sin, all of a sudden there's something else going on. And it just keeps growing and growing. And then all of a sudden it becomes very comfortable. I'm just kind of comfortable with it. It doesn't look that bad. It, you know what? From a distance, my yard looks good. You know, weeds can be green too. Then you start saying, you know what? Weeds have a right to live. Our bodies are the temple, amen? amen? And as I prayed about this, the Lord brought this, this, this verse to my mind. It's found in Haggai chapter 1. Two times the Lord says, consider your ways. And in, if you know Haggai, the book, you know that he's talking about the people of Israel, they've been brought out of captivity. They're supposed to rebuild the temple. And they're like, nah, it's not time. It's just not the right time. You know, we got our things to do. And God's saying, consider your ways. And that's what I want you to do tonight. The temple is your body. Consider your ways. Because I know... If any one of you is like anything like me, you have plenty of things to consider. You have not arrived. You have not arrived. As good as you are, as far as you've come, you're not there yet. There's still work to be done. There's still work to be done in this church, amen? People that are working in ministries, how many would like a little more help? Amen? Amen? Oh, I guess you got all the help you need. Come on down to my church. I could use some more, you know? We forget that 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it's, and Paul had to write this to the church at Corinth. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not of your own, for ye are bought with a price. And we know what that price is, amen? I don't need to remind you. 
Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. If you're saved, you belong to him. Your life is no longer yours. I am crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He bought me. When I got saved, I was, I'm in. I'm all yours. I am completely yours. That's what salvation is. Salvation is, I'll be there when it's convenient. I'll change as long as I agree to it. I'll change as long as I think it's a good thing. That's, that's wrong thinking. Pastor Metzger used to say, that's stinking thinking. When your pastor preaches against the abomination of the gay agenda or the mutilation of our children by those who seek to transgender them, he is fulfilling his obligation to hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. He's doing his job. He knows that there's consequences when we refuse to hear the words of the Lord, to hearken unto him. Look at verse 10. It says there in, uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 10, it says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. I don't want that. I want to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear, Man, Tom, you could have done so much better. You know, the judgment seat of Christ does await us all, right? It's not all fun and games, right? Both the good and the bad will be judged at that judgment seat. I always tell people, hey, keep a short list, would you? 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Before you go to sleep tonight, fess up that you messed up. Because that, you know, he's not the kind. <laughs> How many have known somebody that brings up things over and over? You've repented a thousand times, but they just keep bringing it up. Do you remember when you, blah, 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 blah. Remember, Mike, when you played that baseball game and you missed that ball at shortstop or what? Do you remember? You cost us a ser- No, I mean, you can't repent enough. God's not like that. One and done. Aren't you glad? One and done. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles over to Esther chapter 3. Because some of these consequences, when people don't obey the word of God, they can be long-lasting. And some can even affect our ancestors. Now, in Esther chapter 3, it says, After these things did King Azarias promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants in, that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Now we know, according to Esther 2.5, that Mordecai was a Jew, and we should know that a Jew would never bow to anyone before, uh, other than the Lord. Amen? I mean, we have the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? Verse 3, it says, Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgresseth the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them. He didn't hear, he wasn't afraid of men, he reverenced God. That they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's manners would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, 
For they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy what? All the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom, even the people of Mordecai. Now Haman was an Agadite, a descendant of the Amalekites. He should have never even been born. Do you hear me? He should have never even been born. If the Israelites, King Saul, had done exactly what God had commanded them, and this was some 500 years prior. Now down in verse 10, Haman is called the Jew's enemy. The Amalekites were the Jews' enemies ever since they came in contact with them. And as we were told earlier in 1 Samuel 15, 2, the Lord remembered what Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. These Amalekites were sneaky people. They lurked in the bushes waiting for their prey. Who also walks around seeking whom he may devour? Who else is sneaky? The Lord gives us further details of these people in Deuteronomy 25, 17, and 18. When he spoke to Moses, he said, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way, and smote the hindermost, hindermost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. The, Amal uh, the Amalekites were not just sneaky. They were cowards. They attacked the weak and the feeble. Later in history, they would attack Ziglag when David and his men were away. This is a, a characteristic of these people. They attack women and children, the weak, those that can't defend themselves. Does that sound familiar? How many remember October 7th last year? Who did they go after? Did the, did the Hamas go after a military installation? No, they attacked women and children and those that could not defend themselves. I don't know about you, but I won't be surprised when all is said and done and when all knowledge is available to us that we will find that the leaders of Hamas are descendants of the Amalekites. They have the same MO. Sometimes the consequences when we refuse to take heed to the word of God can be passed on by generation to generation to generation. I remember Pastor Bredo teaching us in the Institute, the things that you allow in your life, your children will take to the next degree. It's true. God says that the sins can be passed down even to the fourth generation. So I hope tonight you've, 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 the Lord has pricked your heart about something. The lesson here for us all tonight is to, hey, we just need to stop taking for granted that everything we allow in our lives, God's okay with. Maybe it's time to get back in touch with the Holy Spirit and say, you know, Lord, what, what is it that I haven't been doing that I need to do? What is it that I've been doing that I need to stop? And then Repent. You are blessed as a church that you have a pastor who will tell you the truth unashamedly. You are blessed. Stand by him. Stand by the word. Help him. Help yourselves. You have, I see people here that have children. You want your children growing up in a church that stands on the truth by God's grace. And I think that's what you have here. But that doesn't mean you'll have it here tomorrow. It's up to you. All of you. You are the body. You understand that, right? You are the body. Pastor is just the ruler. <laughs> he's, he's the head. You do need to listen to him. He's not a man that lords over everybody. 
He's not knocking on your door, seeing what you're watching on TV or on the internet or any of that other stuff, right? He's not doing that. I didn't think so. No. But he is the rule, and he does that through the word of God. Support him. Love him. Care for him. Five years ago, I had a heart attack. It scared our people. Bob's as human as the rest of us. Don't take him for granted. And I want you to know, he didn't pay me a single penny to say all these nice things about him. <laughs> One next thing. Next week, our church down in Naples, actually it's up in Naples. We just had the discussion. You've got to go up to get to Naples. Anyways, is our Bible conference. Do you know that your pastor will be preaching on Saturday? Why not come down and support him? You know what? Our church will feed you a nice barbecue dinner afterwards. And then if you got more time, you could hear Pastor Billy preach. Billy would preach. You could hear more of God's word. Maybe, maybe even get your heart convicted about something. And for the glory of God, you could repent. Because those two guys are way better preachers than I am. So let's pray and you can be dismissed, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your word most of all. I thank you for this church. What a blessing it is to be privileged to come and speak to these people. And Lord, I pray that they understand everything that you had to say tonight. Uh, most of it's come directly from your word. So please, help us as individuals Put a light on our, our life. Let us look into the mirror of your word. Let us realize that there's no way we're even close to looking like Jesus yet and when there's a lot to do. And Lord, and I know you're an encourager. We don't have to walk around with boo-boo faces. No, we can turn those frowns upside down. And look up to you and know that we're forgiven and that you will help us do that which you call us to do. You're such a good and gracious God. Thank you. And Lord, please help us. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. And all God's people would say once again, amen. amen. Thank you very much.